90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today, we're going to provide an introduction to the mental health laws of the state of New York, and our special guests are attorney Angela Rabalda, who is a graduate of Nassau Community College and the paralegal program here, and now she's a partner at Chevetti, Corgan, D. Edwards, Weinberg, and Nicholson, and she's very involved in this field and also William D. Buckley, who's with the law firm of Marx, O'Neill, O'Brien, Dougherty, and Kelly. Welcome to both of you to Law You Should Know, and thank you for giving us an introduction to the various laws that cover mental health and, and when a lawyer out there or a family out there might be, be involved with them. Kevin, what are some of the basic things that someone should know about the mental health laws? Well, I think what people should realize is that when they are admitted to the hospital psych department, that if they do not agree with the decision to keep them in the hospital by the doctors or to take medication or to continue with treatment in the community when they leave the hospital, they do have resort to the courts of the state of New York. They have constitutional rights that would be protected. I agree with Bill. There's various mechanisms by which a patient could request release by submitting a letter, at which point the hospital has a choice they have to make. They either have 72 hours to make the decision to retain that patient by going to court, asking the court to retain them for 15 days, or they have to discharge the patient. But they only have 72 hours to file that letter or uh, discharge the patient. And you are confined during that period. Absolutely. So it's unlike jail, where you might get a right out on bail or released right away within, let's say, 12 or 24 hours, you can be held for much longer and you're presumed in need of treatment and confinement until a judge says otherwise. Yeah, the doctors do have a responsibility to make sure that you have a mental illness and that you need the hospitalization because you're a danger to yourself or others, or you really require hospitalization. If you get yourself into a situation where you're in the emergency room on Friday night, you are going to be in the hospital for a few days. You're not going to get immediate response like an order of a habeas corpus to have you released, but you will have a rather short period of hospitalization before the judge says, okay, come into court now. Well, unfortunately, though, if you end up in the hospital on a Friday night and the paperwork is filed on Monday, you're not making it to court until the following week. So you're actually in the hospital for over a week. And and a family or someone can institute this uh, process, uh, maybe for good reasons, maybe for not. Um, It could be the police or an emergency room referring someone for this, but or even a citizen can have someone brought to the emergency room for evaluation if two doctors, and of course, if someone's grabbed by the police, they're probably not going to be in a good frame of mind. But if they're excited or agitated, the two doctors in the emergency room are needed to have them committed for a little longer for evaluation. Yes, when people, if, if you think that your child, for example, you know, is doing something dangerous, he's stocking guns, he's not taking medication, he's threatening violence, et cetera, like that, you can make a petition to the court to have that person picked up and brought before the judge to decide whether they should go to the hospital or not. But most people I'd say that Angela and I have dealt with are generally people who have been brought to the emergency department from the community. There was an event where the police were summoned. Right. I, I had one where a child went to school, made some threats at school, and the school contacted the police, and the police brought the patient to the hospital at which point a psychiatrist came down to the ER and involuntarily retained them for at least 48 hours. And then they had another physician sign off on that document, allowing for retention up for another 15 days. That patient never actually wrote a letter requesting release. If if the patient writes a letter requesting release, 
that's when the courts get involved. Yeah, if you're brought to the emergency department, you'll be held there for tw- you can be held there for 24 hours against your wishes, presuming a physician has decided you need that, and then the second physician has to be a psychiatrist right. who says that you need hospitalization for two days. During, you can always put a note into the di- director saying, "I want to go to court," all right, but that's going to take a few days to get there. Um, once you've been held there for the two days, then the hospital can hold you on the paperwork they fill out for 15 days, actually. And during that 15 days, you can request to go to court. And when that 15 days are over, you can ask to go to court again. If they, because there, there's always, there are different steps along the way. Right. And there, longer they and there is you. someone to represent the patient uh, free of charge, if necessary, to advocate for them. And that's through the mental hygiene legal services that are provided. And they probably come to the state hospital at least during the week and, and meet with people who are going to be before the court to evaluate their status. So I know my hospital, every time we have applications made to the court in the petition, that's usually the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, we specifically ask that mental hygiene legal services be appointed for this patient so that the patient has adequate representation and also because we know the patient wants to participate in the hearing, so they're entitled to representation. Whenever the hospital goes to the courthouse with paperwork, they generally have, in, 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 all the time, will have something in their petition that said, and we request that the court please appoint the mental hygiene legal service to represent the patient. And as you mentioned before, if the person, be they a ch- child or an, uh, let's say an adult, voluntarily agrees to stay at the hospital, they're kind of in control of the discharge unless, you know, some court order decides otherwise. Yeah, that's the 72-hour letter, right? Well, yeah. Right. If the patient writes a letter saying, I no longer want to be in this hospital, uh, I want out, uh, the hospital then has to make the decision. You have 72 hours to either petition the court for retention, asking the court to retain them for either 60 or 15 days, depending mm-hmm. on what the hospital is requesting based on their legal status, or they have to discharge the patient. And the person kind of has the option whether to opt to go in voluntarily. Is there a difference? Yeah, most people who enter the hospital are, are, are entering voluntarily, all right? However, those people who are brought, I guess, against their wishes are being admitted involuntarily, all right? And uh, b- both people, both voluntary and involuntary people, can send uh, a piece of paper on toilet paper, if you want, to your doctor, to the nursing station, saying, I want out of here, which obligates the hospital to notify the courts that we have somebody who wants to go home and to please appoint the Mental Hygiene Legal Service to represent them. The hospitalization can be extended to beyond that, let's say if the hospital needs more time to treat and evaluate the patient? Yeah, they can be converted from what they consider their emergency standard under Section 9.39 of the Mental Hygiene Law to what's uh, a two-physician consent under 9.27 of the Mental Hygiene Law, and then they can be kept up to 60 days, and then sometimes from there... If the treatment's still not working, they'll petition the court for even more time. Yeah, the, the person is uh, admitted first for 15 days as an emergency patient, and they can request to go to court then. Then what happens is the hospital, after the 15 days, has to convert you by what's called 2PC, two physician certifications, and they can hold you then for up to 60 days. At both levels, when you're an emergency patient, you're entitled to go to court for a hearing. If you lose, you can go for another hearing when they convert you to the 2PC 60-day retention. And what is the standard that the court must follow or the hospital must follow to try to keep you at the hospital? When you're in that emergency standard under 9.39, you have to prove that this patient is a danger to himself or others. If the hospital fails in their burden to show that the patient is dangerous, the court will not grant the hospital's application to retain. And what are some ways the hospital may show that and the patient can try to counter that? That's an interesting question with hearsay. What will happen is when a doctor goes into the, to the courthouse and wants to tell, well, and you, you may ask the doctor the question, what, what caused the hospital? What was the patient like when they arrived at the emergency room? Now, the answer that Angela and I want is no hearsay. We want something to say, well, the person came in and she was wrapped in a sheet by the police because she was naked on the street, or she was shouting and screaming without stopping. She was pulling her hair out. She was biting police officers. You want that. But the doctor will sometimes say, well, apparently she was in the park, right? And now that's hearsay. Now, the doctor was not there in the park to see that. So you need to avoid that. And it won't come in. It'll be objected to, and the judge will sustain that objection. (laughs) It's great if uh, for the hospital when the patient actually caused some kind of injury to either a staff member or another patient on the unit because then you're showing that they're dangerous. 
doesn't always happen like that. Yeah. Yeah, most of the time, Angela and I have been lucky. I think that the doctors that we bring to court are the doctors who have been treating the patient. So those doctors have enough information about the patient firsthand to say, this patient, when I went to examine her, she kicked me. When I want to ask questions, she's mute. She will not respond. I saw her throwing food in the cafeteria. Some hospitals will send a doctor to court who is not that familiar with the patient but knows the chart, all right? And then we have to go to the chart and try to see, okay, can we get this hearsay information in the chart in under the exception, the hearsay exceptions too? So in, in a moment, I will come back to that and what might be some more ambiguous situations and the road to discharge and follow-up. <clears throat> i just like to remind our listeners that we're talking with attorneys William D. Buckley of Marks O'Neill, O'Brien, Darity, and Kelly, and Angela Robardo, who's a graduate of the paralegal program right here at Nassau Community College, and she's a partner, Chiavetti, Corgan, D. Edwards, Weinberg, and Nicholson. We're talking about the mental health laws in New York State. You're listening to Law You Should Know on 90.3 WHBC, the voice of Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. If you missed any portion of the program or you want to hear it again, the podcast is available at nccradio.org. So what happens as time goes on and maybe 60 days have passed, the court looks back at the situation, and what are some options at, at that point? Well, the court usually doesn't look back after the 60 days. The patient will either get released after 60 days or will be back in court asking for more time. Yeah, many patients are not all that sick that they need a 60-day admission to the hospital. That if they accept treatment in the hospital, which is usually going to be by medication as well as art therapy, group therapy, uh, individual therapy with one of the psychologists, you don't generally need 60 days. But sometimes you will have a person who's uncooperative with treatment or is so ill that they need more than 60 days. What happens then, at the end of 60 days, you can the, court, the hospital can petition to keep the person for six months. Right. And even if the patient hasn't asked to go to court, once we've had somebody for 60 days in the hospital, we must go to court and alert the court to the fact that there's a patient at the ABC hospital who has been here for 60 days, all right, on involuntary admission. So that person should be brought before the court to make sure that we're not uh, basically jailing somebody. You know, another, another component, though, of this is that if you have a patient who you go to court to get a retention on to keep them at the hospital. If that patient is refusing to take medication, the hospital then has another application that they're gonna to have to make. They're gonna to have to do a treatment over objection for that patient to basically go to court and say, hey, judge, I need you to order that this patient take the medication in order to get the patient well. And so we come across that scenario quite often where we're submitting various applications to the court for treatment over objection. If they're going to be discharged, hopefully sooner rather than later, is there usually have to be a treatment plan in effect, which may call for medication, may call for some type of housing and appropriate, you know, while they're not working, just overnight housing or, or treatment or follow-up outpatient visits? Um, yes. What happens is everybody discharged from the hospital is entitled by law to have a treatment plan in place for when they leave the hospital. Now, some people, the hospital will petition saying, you've been hospitalized in the past twice, all right, for failure to comply with community treatment when you're in the community. And then the court can give an order called an, an order of assisted outpatient treatment, AOT. Assisted outpatient treatment means you'll have a plan. Usually it's going to require you to have medication. It's going to require you to probably go to therapy. It might have a housing component to it of where you're going to live. Uh, you will have a social worker appointed to take care of you, your caseworker, and you may even have what's called the ACT team, yep. which is a sort of community treatment. And most patients leave the hospital without having to have an AOT plan, but many people do, all right, go that way. And once the person is out and released, does the court monitor to see if they comply with the treatment? Or just the whole scenario begins again? They, they, there's some incident, they go back in, and then the court picks it up again? It's usually that some incident occurs and they're brought out of the community back into the hospital. Yeah. I will say, just as a reminder, a patient cannot be discharged from a hospital unless it's considered a safe discharge. So you mm -hmm. can never discharge a patient to the street. So if the patient is not willing to go into a shelter and they don't have a home to go to, that's true for medical patients, too, of for course, not patients. just psych yeah, patients. You have to have to a anybody. safe treatment plan. And what happens if, let's say, the year is up and they're still in the mental institution? What happens then? Well, the hospitals that Angela and I have worked with generally are short-term 
care hospitals, all right? So what happens after we've had you for six months, we can then petition to keep you for one year. And then after one year, we can petition for two years. Now, most hospitals are not equipped for that. So what happens is the patient will usually be transferred to a long-term care hospital, which here in New York would be similar to Pilgrim State Hospital, the Bronx Psychiatric Center to Creedmore. And there you're supposed to get, let's say, mental health and and medical treatment. And will you come up periodically before the court? Yes. If if you're in the state hospital, the same thing applies. All right. The the state hospital cannot hold you without having the court's permission. Uh, You'll get initially uh, up to six months. Then you'll get a one year. Then you'll get a two year. And when you petition also, you could petition, say, for two years. The judge will bring you in and say, well, you know, I don't think the evidence that the doctor has given me says that we really need two years. Uh, let's say one year, all right? And then you can come back again and petition for more time after that. But the thing is, you're being monitored by the courts all the way along, which was not the case until the 1960s. Right. There's a special category of people that are known as the Willowbrook class of people that the court became very interested in. doesn't fall under the mental hygiene law, but it will fall under the Family Health Care Decision Act. These are These are patients who were developmentally disabled, intellectually disabled, They were in uh, Willowbrook, and because of what took place at Willowbrook, they have extra added precautions for trying to keep those patients. And we we wanted to come to a discussion of the Family Health Care Decisions Act, which became law after Willowbrook. So what are some of their rights, and and how will their cases be uh, considered? That's Angela's side. Yes, go ahead, Angela. (laughs) Strong suit. (laughs) So, you know, with the Family Health Care Decision Act, which is codified in the public health law, it's a statute that helps patients that are on a medical floor that lack decisional capacity to get treatment over their objection. There's various types of patients that would fall under this category. It would be patients that are an adult over the age of 18 that are on a medical floor and because of their underlying illness, uh, for example, they're a dialysis patient and because of the toxins in their kidneys building up, they are lacking decisional capacity to make a decision. In that scenario, the hospital goes to court for an order that the court grant the hospital permission to give dialysis. And, And sometimes the family may have asked to have a guardian appointed. Yes, the family, sometimes the patient has a guardian that was appointed by the court, and in that scenario, the guardian could make the decisions. But if the patient is objecting to the treatment that's being requested, it doesn't matter if you're the guardian, the healthcare proxy, you're going to court because the patient's objection is going to prevail. The trumps, yeah. And this could also be, let's say, for an elderly person who has Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. some Absolutely. other disease, and it keeps them from mentally functioning to evaluate and consent to the treatment. Yeah, you'll sometimes see, for example, an elderly person come in or a young person with diabetes that's going to require an amputation of a foot, but the person has lost capacity to make that decision or says, you know, like, hell, I'll do that or something. And then the doctor has to decide, okay, let me get a psychiatrist in here to do an evaluation. And and then the court might decide based on the The, recommendations of all these people. Yes, the court routinely decides these and even surgery, whether it's advisable or yes. not. And sometimes it's not a clear-cut situation. Yeah. And the, the, in, in the, up until COVID, all right, what happened is the judge would come to the hospital yep. and usually conduct the hearing at bedside. The judge wanted to see the patient. The yep. judge would show up with a clerk, with a court reporter, with a court officer, and we would have a hearing right there. Now it's done on Zoom. Now right? it's done uh, <laughs> via Microsoft Teams. But, yeah, I still call them bedside hearings yes, because um, I've always known them as bedside hearings. I remember the days of waiting you know, in the patient's room or in a conference room at the hospital. And it's the entire court entourage, security, court officers that would come to the hospital. And the court will try to hear from the patient uh, to see if they're able to decide or see what their feelings may be yes. about the situation? Yeah, that's why the, the, it was done at bedside. Is that the, doc, the judge wants to see the patient, all right, to see what does the person respond when we, when, you know, sometimes the, the patient will throw you out of the room, all right? So we can't have the, the, the hearing in the bedroom like we normally do. We'll have to go down to a conference room. I just want to remind our listeners, we're talking about the mental health laws of New York State and just an introduction to them. Our special guest are William D. Buckley. He's an attorney with the firm of Marks O'Neill, O'Brien, Dowdy, and Kelly, and Angela Rivaldo, and she's a graduate of the paralegal program at Nassau Community College and obviously went on after that to college and law school. And she's a partner at Schiavetti, Corgan, D. Edwards, Weinberg, and Nicholson. And you're listening to Law You Should Know 
on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nass Community College. If you missed any portion of this show, please go to the podcast, and you're welcome to tell other people about it at nccradio.org. I'd also like to mention we're, we're dedicating this program to Kevin McMullen, who recently passed away. He's been a guest on the show. He helped arrange for various people, attorneys to appear on the show. And he helped arrange for our guests to come today for, for this program. And he was a graduate of Chaminade High School and a legal scholar and uh, an expert at many things. So what other issues come up in the Family Health Care Decisions Act? So we talked about the first group of patients, patients that are over the age of 18. But then you've got another whole category of patients, the patients that are known as developmentally disabled, also known as intellectually disabled who have an extra added layer of protection. There's so many different scenarios with those types of patients. You could have a patient who resides in the community who is not living in what's known as an an OPWDD facility, which is the Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities. If those patients have an actively involved family member, and it's all statute-driven, you know, in priority order, who would qualify? You know, that that person, that actively involved family member could technically decide treatment decisions for beneficial treatment, what we call consents for treatment. But if the patient, again, is objecting, you're going to court. In each of these situations, you usually end up before a judge asking the judge to order the treatment over objection. And they're tough situations. I've had patients needing an amputation. I've had a developmentally disabled woman who was in her very early 60s with cancer needing a salpingiferectomy, which is removal of her ovaries, a hysterectomy because she had uterine cancer. And they were not able to consent to these procedures. Because this particular patient had the IQ of what was determined to be a five-year-old. So in that scenario, no, she lacked decisional capacity. And there was, you know, what to do? What are we going to do? She's in her early 60s. She could have a good quality of life if we went in and removed her ovaries and her uterus, but we needed the court's permission to do it. In that case, MHLS did actually represent the patient. And a guardian is also going to be appointed for the the patient? Yes. And what's the role of that guardian? How did they get appointed? So years ago, MHLS is appointed by statute under the mental hygiene law. This is not the mental hygiene law. This is a different section of the public health law. So the courts routinely will ask a guardian ad litem, a private attorney, usually off of the 18B court appointed list, to step in and represent the interests of the patient at the hearing stage. And it's a fine balance. You want to do what your client wants, but also what's best for the patient. And if a family was confronting these issues, they can go to the guardianship department of the local Supreme Court and get information on the procedures and and how to take the first steps? You know, usually under the Family Health Care Decision Act, it usually you could have an actively involved family member, but they aren't the ones making the application. It's usually the hospital saying you need an amputation and the family member is usually in agreement with the hospital. The issue becomes the patient is not in agreement. Mm -hmm. The family members are usually very supportive to what has been recommended by the attending physician. But you may want to have a family member as the guardian, not someone named by the suggested by the hospital. Well, not for the purpose of a hearing to get court ordered treatment. You might want to have a guardian in place for that person for, for every for every, for every or, day. Yeah, for in the for community. Every, yeah, yeah, about where you're going to live, what you know, how much money you'll have to spend on okay. your own. Okay, we just have a little time in the show. Any other final thoughts that you would? like to offer if i could just say sure all the way through this process the hospital always has the burden of proof and the hospital has to prove that you have a mental illness that the mental illness is interfering with your ability to make rational decisions and therefore the judge has to make the decision for you and in your best interests so and we have to make our that um, we have to cross the threshold of showing by clear and convincing evidence so it's not it's like this, like it is standardly in a in a trial on a personal injury case where it's preponderance. And, and also, the judge may talk to the person if they have thoughts yeah. and, mm-hmm. and get their impressions and and get a sense of them as well. Mm-hmm. You know, just noting what Bill had said under the Family Health Care Decision Act, you don't have to have a psychiatric illness. You don't have to be mentally ill. Mm-hmm. These could be patients that lack decisional capacity because of their underlying medical condition. Mm-hmm. In that scenario, the hospital still has the burden of proof. The hospital still has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the treatment is necessary um, and that the patient lacks decisional capacity to give a reasonable refusal or consent to the proposed treatment. 
And just very briefly, what if before they get to the hospital in that level, the family just thinks someone needs to have decision-making power for an elderly relative, someone who had some kind of illness that has rendered them a little bit uh, disabled? I would say if you don't want to go the route of a guardian, you should have a health care proxy put into place, knowing what that person's wishes So that could are. be done bef- while they're competent to as name long someone. As long as yes. they're competent. Mm-hmm. And if they weren't competent, if it wasn't done before, the family could go to the guardianship part and institute some proceedings to be appointed guardian. The problem with that is an Article 81 guardianship under the mental hygiene law takes a year to get a guardianship appointed in that the court's going to make a very serious inquiry into whether or not you should have your rights to take care of yourself taken away. Right. So, And what if there's some urgent situation? Then the hospital would do it? Yeah, it would be step by step, so to speak. Yeah. That's when the guardian ad litem gets appointed for purposes of the hearing. Yeah. And generally the family of the person, if they have a family member, and of course a lot of people who are poor don't, they have no, their family is sick of them, their their mental illness or or the problems that they've created. But, but they're going to have their day in court, yes. and, and all these different processes will take place, whether they're rich mm-hmm. or poor. Yeah, one of the mental hygiene legal services attorneys, who was an old timer, told me in the 1960s, all you had to do to compel someone to take medication or stay in the hospital was get a doctor to fill out an affidavit. And luckily, with the civil rights movement, that's all changed now. We have uh, the mental hygiene law, and, and the court's going to weigh yeah. all those different different issues, decide the burden of proof, and and render an opinion. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it's not taken taken lightly. I'd like to thank our guests, William D. Buckley of Marks O'Neill, O'Brien, Dowdy, and Kelly, and Angela M. Ribaldo for being our guest on Law You Should Know. And she's with Shiavetti, Corgan, D. Edwards, Weinberg, and Nicholson. Keep in mind, if you missed any portion of the program, you want to tell someone else about it, just go to the website, nccradio.org. And please join us next week at this same time for another program on Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHBC, the voice of Nassau Community College. They are our cuddlers and co-workers, purr machines and love bugs, and constant companions. They are our pets, our family, and they make life so much better. When we face unexpected challenges in life, so do our pets. That's why we're on a mission to support people who love their pets and the pets who love their people, ensuring these families stay exactly where they belong, together. And you have something to offer. With an open heart and mind, there is nothing you can't do. There's no gesture too small or too big when it comes to helping. Whether donating a bag of kibble, sharing an Instagram post of a lost cat, or welcoming a foster pet into your home, every bit of kindness counts. You can help keep pets and people together. Visit PetsAndPeopleTogether.org to learn how to be a helper in your community. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council.